Well, I wanted to show off a little something, kind of premiere something at TED from our labs. And um, let me pull this out. So this is actually a quantum dot matrix printed thin screen computer. Um, cost about $3 to make. Um, can you guys see that OK? We're having a few problems with contrast, and we've got some problems with, uh, with power management. But I'm going to present my entire presentation off of this thin, uh, a thin piece of film. It was actually printed using a special kind of an ink and, and uh, down at the sort of nano level. And um, I'm actually going to show it off here. We, we think it's $3 now. It'll probably get down to a few pennies in a few years. Now, to put that in context, in 2005, the semiconductor industry reported that we made more transistors than grains of rice, and we made them cheaper. So you guys at CMU probably aren't surprised that we're able to do this now. You know, this is sort of just the next turn of the screw. Um, so um, we were going to have an overhead projector. Um, did you guys remember that? Just hold on. <laughs> All right, don't, don't count this against me. Hold on. Um, what, oh, where is the projector? I'm going to, um, let me. Can we bring it out here? We can't bring it out. No, it's, it's uh, there. There, OK. I'm going to give you a few of these, because we don't have uh, quite enough power to run it all on one. So um, once you get set up, I'll, I'll continue. So um, you know, the interesting thing about these, um, these thin films, you can just you know, print them. They're cheap, you know, a few pennies, a few dollars. Um, every pixel is actually a camera. So this is kind of an interesting. You know, I can actually bend this and do a wide angle shot of all of you guys. So at the count of three, I'd like everybody to say cheese. You ready? One. Two, three. Cheese. Cheese. All right, I got it. My wife asked me to take a picture while I was up here. I'm kind of excited. So, um, you know, this, this is about probably three Watsons per inch in terms of computational power. Um, and, and it uses a, a substrate called the Casimir effect for actually generating most of its electricity. It, it, it really is parasitic. So if I shake it, it actually generates electricity. My, my fingers heat it up and things like that. Um, so, Normally, when we talk about, about computing devices, we think about two or three per, um, let's go one slide forward. Perfect. Um, hopefully, he'll get that set up. Um, we usually think about two or three per person. You know, when we talk about devices, we've got a phone, we've got a laptop, we've got a tablet. But what happens when these come online? And, and our research predict that we're going to probably be looking at trillions of little devices that are casually printed. Print a computer as easily as you print a picture within the next five years. So what happens when that actually comes to pass? We'll be talking about trillions of computing devices, not just, you know, we just hit 2 billion internet users last year. Trillions. So if you just think about the electric sockets and, and the light switches that we have in the world, they've done an estimate that about 300 billion of those get changed out every maybe 10 years. So if just a fraction of those light switches and sockets, just the simple boring things get switched out, analysts have said, we'll lower energy usage in the entire world by between 40 and 60% because we'll be able to actually get feedback loops. If you plug a copier into them, we're actually working with some guys that have circuits already for $10. You plug a copier in, you can tell when it's printing a thick paper or a thin paper, or a double-sided or a single-sided sheet of paper, just by the electrical signature. So this is all real stuff. It's actually happening. Um, so I said trillions. Now, humans haven't really solved the problem of trillions. That's a really big number. It's much bigger than billion. If you count back in seconds, a trillion seconds is 30,000 years ago from right now. Right? We were living in caves. We were teaching dogs to be our friends. Um, <laughs> nobody else would have us. Uh, so, so that's what we're talking about. And although we haven't solved the problem of, of trillions, nature has. Every one of you has trillions of cells in your body. In your sophisticated computer in your own right, you, know, you actually process information. You display information. You, you think about things. You communicate. Um, and you don't reboot every month. You know, you'll go like 80 years on a, a good clip. I'm not sure if I'll make it that far, but a lot of you will go 80 years without a big system failure. So nature's been doing this for a long time. And so that's what I want to talk a little about. Are we all, all set up and ready to go up there? Can you uh, turn on the, turn on the uh, projector? Great. Um, so my, my topic's liquidity. Can you focus that? Thanks. Um, it's going to be That's funny. <laughs> All right, I know it's like late in the day and everything. Yeah, can you clean that up? <laughs> Thanks. Get a haircut, man. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about actually what nature can teach us 
about computing systems and sort of how we can handle this deluge of information that we're going to have. How can we flow it? How can we make sure that we don't get overtaken by the flood? So what can nature teach us about computing systems? Here's the system in action. Actually, when you put two of them together, they actually understand that they're near each other, and then they communicate and they, they help coordinate on a display, as long as you're nice to them. Um, so, so what can nature teach us about computing systems? If you think about it, um, you know, we haven't, you can, you can go ahead and, uh, and change that slide. Let's see if we can change it. Um, you know, we haven't been dealing with information for too long. Maybe, you know, how long has humans been encoding information? You know, maybe, um, I don't know, if you were to go back to the 1950s when Claude Shannon came up with the information theory, the theory of information, maybe we've been dealing with it, you know, back when Gutenberg's, you know, first started making a book. I mean, okay, we were printing books back then. Even if you think about symbols and early writing systems, we're really only talking about maybe four to 6,000 years ago. That's about how long humans have been dealing with information and coping with it, and maybe 6,000 years. We are sort of rank amateurs when it comes to information. Let me change the next one. Um, so, okay, humans, 6,000 years. Um, nature, on the other hand, you're gonna have to shuffle a few of these because I didn't have enough room. So nature, on the other hand, has been dealing with information for, re <laughs> keep going, really long time. It turns out that nature's been dealing with information, encoding it, storing it, replicating it, moving it around for almost three billion years just here on Earth. So this is kind of amazing, right? So, so the interesting question, really, um, when we think about it, is sort of what can nature teach us about computing systems? And, and that's kind of uh, what I'd like to talk about today. So um, we know a few things at the basic level. We know that there are sort of levels of complexity. Protons and neutrons make atoms. Atoms make molecules, molecule cells, cells, organs. Organs make us. Um, each one of those levels can be defined, modeled separately, and understood differently. They're all they're sort of levels of complexity. One builds on the other in, in terms of abstraction. And this is a really powerful pattern from nature. Um, in fact, our own uh, Herb Simon, who, who used to work here, came up with the concept for this. He called it layered semantics. It means that the lower level elements don't actually have to know what they're going to be used for in the upper level. So the atoms don't need to know they're going to be turned into molecules to work. This clean separation creates sort of foundational layers so that we can build things and we know that stuff isn't you know, like a house of cards that's gonna fall apart underneath our, underneath our hands. So this is a really important concept. And um, I didn't mention DNA. You know, maybe I should have, I don't know, put that between molecules and cells. Um, DNA is kind of interesting. DNA is sort of life's way of containing information. It's sort of, it's the storehouse for all the information um, that makes you or I who we are. Um, so this is an interesting thing. Um, let's think about DNA for a moment. You know, life uses DNA in the form of cells. Chromosomes uh, actually you know, hold a bunch of genes. And it uses it to replicate it and to send it around and to shuffle it around. It is a container for information, for life's information, in the form of genes. And not only a container for you and I. This is the same container for all life on Earth. right? Just one thing, DNA, in the form of chromosomes holding genes. So that's a big deal. It's sort of the standard container for everything. And containerization, that's the design pattern that we found. You know, we use it, too, in, in the world. Um, if you think about something like maybe, I don't know, the lowly shipping container. Um, you know, that doesn't seem very exciting, but this is one of the things that actually totally revolutionized worldwide commerce. You know, it's a standard size. It can be picked up and moved around. You can mutate it. You can add things. You can remove things. You can extend things. This is exactly what we do with chromosomes, with genes. We mutate. We extend. We recombine. And we have the standard container that allows us to do this. In fact, we don't need to know what's inside the box to do things. This is pretty interesting. So when shipping containers came about, it really changed things. Back in the old days, longshoremen had to pile up stuff in nets. You know, you had to make sure you were very, hey, don't put the anvils on top of the bananas. Thanks. So you had to be very careful. <laughs> Voice activated. <laughs> you know, not to mess it up. But once we got a container, everything changed. Right? We didn't need to know what was in it. All we needed to know were the dimensions. And once we had the dimensions, we could make boats, we could make trucks, we could make cranes, we could start shuffling information in the form of commerce all over the world. So a lot of people don't really uh, appreciate this. There's a wonderful book called The Box, and it actually celebrates the, the shipping container, the lowly shipping container. In fact, the guy who wrote The Box, Mark Levinson, actually said that in his studies, in the decade, right after shipping containers came into use, that was around 1966, the amount of worldwide trade, you know, global trade, was twice as much as global manufacturing and two and a half times as much as global economic output. Right? So just that, that one thing, agreeing on a standard container, 
suddenly exploded and kind of helped make the world flat. So this is a design pattern, right, from nature. You know, you're doing a good job up there. So, you know, <laughs> let's talk about information liquidity for a second. So, so not only that, you know, cells contain DNA, um, but it's sort of life's currency. This is, a, this is sort of a, the idea that genes are stored in little replicable boxes. They're traded, they're passed around in massive quantities, you know, across species boundary and across generations, they are shuffled around to create new value. That's kind of a big deal. <clears throat> now, you might be asking yourself, why is this important? Why do we care about how DNA works, how genes work, and things like that? <clears throat> well, I have no idea what I'm going to say here. Liquid currency was the game-changing innovation, actually, here in our own economic system in the past thousand years. You know, this idea that you could liquidly exchange things for value was a big deal. <clears throat> you know, before this happened, commerce was mostly a barter system. You know, and, and you had to trade different things. And the problem was you couldn't separate the value of the good from the good itself. You know, it was kind of hard to get anywhere when, you know, a sheep is equal to 36 yards of fabric, right? How, how, do, you, how do you scale? How do you interoperate with other cultures? You can't. So Britain took this really seriously, right? They actually appointed the smartest man in the world to head up the Bank of England and recoin the mint back in the 1600s. His name was Isaac Newton. And he was actually a natural philosopher. His job was to look at nature, to figure out the design patterns in nature. And for the next 150 plus years, Britain dominated the economic landscape. So big idea, liquid currency. <clears throat> you can change. Thanks. <laughs> so, you know, nature's liquid currency, DNA, you know, it's flowing, it's replicating, it's recombining, it's all mutating together. And that really is what led to some pretty nice and interesting kind of explosions in things. Think about the Cambrian explosion, right? Creativity. Suddenly, two different animals could get together, organisms, they could recombine some genes and create a third thing. And we have this huge explosion in creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to mess with that one. <laughs> right? So, so um, creativity was fostered because we didn't have to agree on what we were actually going to exchange. We could exchange it. We could play around with it. We could do things. We could invent. We could make new things. And there were many periods like this, not just the Cambrian explosion. I mean, it's kind of what allowed us to take, like, goats and combine them, you know, with other kinds of things and actually make human, human drug-producing goats, which you can now get, transgenically... Um, recompose. That's, that would be unheard of, you know, if we didn't, if we didn't think, you know, uh, you have to kind of think about that, but it turns out to be just a casual thing that we can now do. Um, who would have thought it, right? We can actually recombine from all those different things. You know, nature has all this information. It turns out the lily um, chromosome set, the chromosome set for lilies, um, flowers, is ten times bigger than that of man's, right? So, seems to be getting along pretty good, but it's kind of like a little extra hard drive for, for extra genes down the road. So this is just this amazing thing that's happening out there. And, and, you know, liquid currency totally revolutionized our commerce, our way of doing things in the whole world. And now we're coming to a new kind of thing. We're, we're getting a new economy that's the information economy. You know, and the question is, okay, now that we're able to, like, flow stuff from devices to other devices pretty cheaply, we're able to push them around, is this going to really scale? Is this going to really work? You know, and, and I think what you think of is information is in the computer, and I'm going to move it over to this other computer. Um, but the reality is, when we have trillions of information devices, and they're all sending us billions of messages, it's going to be like flipping the sock inside out. It's going to be not information in the computers, but people, computers, devices, in the information. And that's a completely different mind shift. It's like climbing an entirely different mountain. <laughs> so how are we going to identify all this stuff? Okay, let's imagine that we've done it. We've hit a trillion, a trillion nodes, and that's predicted to be in about five years from now. We're not talking very far away. How are we going to identify information? You know, how are we going to know th what the right thing is? How are we going to know we're talking about the right thing? And this is a really interesting question that we can actually find out from nature as well. Um, nature has this really cool thing. Down at the atomic level, at physics, no two atoms can exist in the same place at the same time. This is actually called Pauli's exclusion principle. Right? It turns out that stuff made of matter just has a unique identity. Right? I can point at a cup 
And we know two cups aren't sitting in the same place at the same time, so you and I can have a conversation about that cup. Right? It's just a given. We know we're talking about the same thing. You know, but what if I, you know, what if I talked about information? You know, something more abstract. What if I talked about like Moby Dick? What am I talking about? Am I talking about my book? Oops. Am I talking about my book, Moby Dick? Am I talking about your book? Am I talking about all the books of Moby Dick? You know, or am I talking about something else? Maybe I'm talking about the pattern of words. So we don't even know necessarily what I'm talking about when I say that. You know, think about um, the old fable of the blind men and the elephant, right? The one, the one blind man grabs the tail, it's a snake! I know it's a snake! And the other one grabs the leg and he says, clearly this is a pillar. And the third one pounds on the belly and he says, it's a wall! Right? So we all think we're talking about the same thing. But in reality, we have imperfect information. Right? We don't even see the whole story. We don't even see the whole picture. We're missing the elephant in the room. Right? So this is, this is a real problem, and that, and that parable is there for a good reason. You know, most, and many maybe, um, arguments are really because people have a confusion about identity. You know, they think they're talking about the same thing, but they're not. And this is a big deal. And you, don't, you might not think it's a big deal today, because we're talking about two or three computers. But I just interviewed a guy who is making drugs right now that work, that go in your body and use the acid in your stomach to generate a wireless signal to a Band-Aid on your wrist. Proteus Biopharma, look it up. They're doing it today. So this is what's happening, right? And we're going to have so much information. It's going to be so wonderful if we can get through all the noise. And to do that, to collaborate, to talk, to be able to have a good conversation, we need to actually be able to know we're talking about the same thing. So can we do this for information? Can we do what, what uh, Pauli does you know, for atoms? It turns out we can't. This is a UUID. It stands for Universally Unique Identity. And, and it's just a really big number. Mathematicians say if we generate a really big kind of random number or label, we're guaranteed that it's unique. Not just unique in my computer or on my database, unique in, not just unique in my city, my country, my world, unique in the universe. I can number every atom and I would still have leftover numbers. So this is how you do it. It's just a mathematical trick. Ah, you say. What about resilience? Okay, we've got trillions of things. We've got all this information. How are we going to scale? How are we going to remain agile? Are we just going to get com completely sort of piled up and overloaded with all this information? So I asked uh, one of our researchers, Dr. Peter Lucas. I said, how does nature handle, he's, he's the head of our uh, research agenda at Maya. I said, how are we going to handle all this? How does nature handle scaling? How does nature handle resilience? And he said, well, it uses something called peer-to-peer -peer networks. I said, oh yeah, like Napster, that's, that's like a bad deal, right? The record company was pretty upset about that whole thing. Um, yeah, it got a bad political rap, but it turns out that pretty much all ultra-complex systems use peer-to-peer -peer as one of their ways of doing things. So I said, well, I, don't, I still don't understand, what does peer-to-peer -peer mean? And he said, well, um, you can't get rid of Moby Dick. You can't get rid of it if you tried. There's no way. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out Moby Dick is an example, it's shared in something called a peer-to-peer -peer network called public libraries. It's massively replicated in, in, uh, in used bookstores, in private libraries. Every single library can be a client. Every single library can be a server. In 30 years, you can still resolve a link if, if the question is Moby Dick. That's pretty interesting. So you can't get rid of Moby Dick because it's in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Well, okay, I just read a research report and there was this link at the end of the research report um, and I'm really interested in it. Um, so I asked around and I said, what percentage of links, what percentage of URIs, universal record indicators or whatever they're called, HTTP things, what percentage of those, I'm sorry, CM, you guys probably know what, it, what that is. <laughs> um, what percentage of those from this report that I have will be able to be resolved in 10 years? What percentage in 20? What percentage in 30? Turns out less than 1%. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Less than 1% of the links in major research papers and books will be able to be resolved in 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Really? Okay, so, so what's your solution? Well, we're just going to copy the things that are really important. You know, we'll make extra copies. Well, how many? Five? Ten? How many is enough? Well, the things that are important will copy a lot. Really? So, you know, gossip, trash talk, Lady Gaga, cat videos. We're going to bequeath those to our children's children. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. What about information that we don't think is important today that turns out to be hugely important to the next generation? Well, we're screwed. It's 
just the bottom line. Let me give you another example from nature, just to drive this point home. So it was thought that the pigments in our eyes, the gene that encodes the pigment in our eyes, was only around in two other kinds of organisms in the whole world. So Dr. Ventner, the Craig Ventner, the guy who, um, who sequenced the human genome, he decided to find out. He outfitted a research ship, and he went out on the ocean, and he took giant buckets of water, 5, 10, 15-gallon buckets of water, and he actually started pulling them out, putting a screen across the top of the buckets, and screening everything that came out of it with his gene sequencer. Everything. He's looking to find out if this gene exists anywhere else. And, you know, he goes deep underwater. He's pulling stuff up. He's pulling stuff out of the high levels of the ocean, the low levels, the northern parts, the cool parts, the warm parts. What does he find? He finds that almost every species in the upper part of the ocean, in the warm parts, have the same receptors that they use for both communication, for energy production. And he found something else. In one barrel of seawater, he found 1.3 million new species and 50,000 new, new, I mean, sorry, new genes and 50,000 new species. I thought this was using some kind of voice recognition system with this film. It doesn't seem to be working. Right? So think about that, right? The ocean is sort of life's hard drive. It's like the backup for all this stuff. We've got nothing like this. And please don't tell me about the cloud, which is like 1960s client server technology. <laughs> please, dear God, don't tell me about that. Um, do we have anything like this in the cloud? Do we have anything like this in the web? Do we have anything that is a standard container with universally unique identity, with mutable and extensibility so it can grow over time? you know, that can be replicated with the most basic processes? Do we have anything like that? No, we don't. We've got bits, we've got bytes, abstract data units. Bit was around the 1950s, designed and developed the byte. We agreed on the 8-bit one around the 1970s. Um, the packet, not bad, you know, none of these have universal identity. The web, nothing. Nothing. If you're going to tell me that HTTP something, something, something is good when I just talk to you about how bad it is, that's not going to work. If you tell me relational databases will do it, that's about the same as a barter economy. It has nothing to do with scaling to this, to this size. But what if we did? And this is the research agenda that we had. What if we actually researched building something based on nature, biomimicry for computing? So we decided to build something. We called it the U-form, the universal form. It's just an abstract data type, just like the bit and the byte. Very simple. We didn't ask people to agree on a whole bunch of stuff. We didn't say the semantic web thing, you know, I'm going to design every shipping container you could ever think of for things. We said keep it simple, right? All it is is a unique identity, just a really long number, attributes and values, right? So you've got a standardized container. You've got universally unique identity. You've also got mutability and extensibility. You can add things over time. The world changes over time. Just glue it on at the end. It's just a container, a shipping container, massively replicated by the most simple of processes. So this is what happened when we actually built the system. We built a system. We started using it with DARPA. They're the sort of department of mad scientists, um, you know, for the government, right? They were invented right after Sputnik circled overhead, and the president said, uh, that was a surprise. I would like to create an agency so that we're not surprised again. And they've been funding some of our research, right? And we found a 400% increase in collaborative decision making in a real system out there, a 300% increase in overall situational awareness, Time to learn went from two weeks to one day to learn the system because it based, it was sort of worked the way we thought. New functionality created in minutes rather than hours and some of that functionality coming from the crowd because it was so easy to recombine. It was like the Cambrian explosion of, in, of innovation. Didn't even show up in the top 10 of network bandwidth. So what I'd like to do is show a live demo using this film of this. Um, do we still have time? Really? No? All right, guys. Um, I, uh, I can't do it now. Um, but, you know, I will be around, and if you, you know, give me some liquid, I'll probably show you something. Thank you very much.